So um, I'll give a, a real quick history because um, there's the industry version and then there's the real version. So Mark and I co-founded Network in 1984 with a very simple vision, release music we love. At that point, the music that we loved wasn't on radio and a lot of it was localized. Not a clue what we were doing and that showed because for the first 10 years, um, we worked other jobs. I worked as a lifeguard, a DJ, at a record store. I worked at a fish plant. Uh, just literally did everything and anything. Mark did the exact same thing. When we looked at our first 10 years and what we put out of the business, we would have been better to have been on welfare than in the music business. So if you haven't been in it for more than 10 years, it's okay. <laughs> it's gonna get better, okay? Um, as we built it, things got a little bit better. We could start to pay ourselves. And in that process, we also realized that there were certain skill sets that we had and that we didn't have. And we made a point of bringing in other partners or other people to work with us who had these skills that we didn't have. And I'm a generalist. I'm not great at anything. Um, but I have an understanding you know, and have an ability to find people who are really, really good at what they do and instill that passion and that inspiration in them to see what we're doing and be part of our family. So I became an artist manager. I didn't plan on being an artist manager, and for the first couple of years, I didn't even call myself an artist manager. But if I didn't book the band's shows and I didn't put them on tour, they wouldn't leave town. And back in those days, the majority of these sales were vinyl, kind of like they are today. Um, cassettes were just coming in. CDs were still another 15 years away. Radio was not part of our plan. And it's still not part of our plan. It's an add-on if there's the opportunity. But it's never why we sell, why we sign an artist. So... Happily went along being an artist manager, did that for the better part of basically 20 years. And for the last maybe four or five of those years, I was away between six to eight months of the year. And I wasn't traveling with my artists. It was the demand of the success of those artists on an international stage, whether it was Europe, whether it was Asia, whether it was South America, or even just in North America, that made it that I had to travel. A lot of the way that I viewed management was not hand-holding, it was strategy. We had huge input to the marketing plans from day one, to the strategies that the record labels would ultimately execute. We had our hands in absolutely everything. No a &R people were allowed in our recording studios. The creative process was done by the artist and only done by the artist. The record company was then fed the music as how I wanted to feed it to them for the strategy that we had already mapped out. But in saying that, we had to win them over to what we were thinking and how we were thinking. And we did a lot of really interesting stuff that back then no one else did. Record companies were used to doing marketing plans that were nationally based marketing plans. We took those same monies and we put it into one city and have an impact in one city. We'd micro market that one city. Then we'd move on to the next and then on to the next. And we could see that it was happening because we were following the data. Nobody else was following the data. No one else knew how to combine the data. It's pretty academic now. But back then, no one was doing it. We could see flames and turn them into bonfires. And the artists, they thought that our rooting was a map of the world and I put on a blindfold and I throw darts at it. That's how they thought that I rooted their tours. Had nothing to do with that, it was all strategic. And what kept them all on the road was every time that they went back, there was more people, more people and more people. And that's how the artist measured it. Because back then, with royalty rates, the value of the intellectual, the intellectual property was not all that great. And most of the money was made on the road. 
Obviously, after massive success, you could renegotiate a contract and you know, see the sort of true value of it. So that went on for about 20 years. Then in the summer of 2017, the, um, I was asked to write a paper by Westminster University in London, England. And I brought in my uh, GM at the time, a fellow named um, Brent Muley, who now runs Apple for, all, for like all of Europe. He's a very, very smart man. And they asked us to write a paper about the future of the music business. It ended up being called Meet the Millennials. Now, millennials is a very common term now. It wasn't a very common term then. Excuse me, that was 2007. Oh, 2007, yeah, yeah, sorry. I'm just thinking backwards here. So in writing that paper, which was painful, because it was getting all of these, I, these ideas down and then having it edited by an editor, and they really drill you know, down on you know, like what's in your head. But we essentially wrote this strategic paper for network for the next decade. We were talking about things that didn't exist. We are talking about something called a digital valet and how it would decimate piracy. It wasn't about litigation that was gonna decimate piracy. It was a digital valet. Something with that you could say, put me together a, a you know, list of the top 20 songs of 1950 so I can give it to my parents for their wedding anniversary. Ultimately, that was Spotify. But Spotify did not exist then. So it was all blue sky. But the profound thing that it did to me is it made me realize that being an artist manager was not where I wanted to be. And that was amplified when I can remember this so well, sitting in my office, number one album in every country in the world. Everyone's popping sham champagne and I'm the grumpy bear in my office. Okay, clearly I'm not enjoying this. So I went, you know what? I just wrote this whole paper, I went through this whole exercise, and I've got a model that's based on not what I wrote. It's not what I believe. So I started thinking, okay, if I'm gonna do this, I have to do two things. One, I have to figure out the strategy from all of these ideas that we had presented. And then two, how am I gonna turn a, a company at that point of 60 people in a completely different direction than what they've been going on for quite a long time? And it was a mindset. One of the first things I did was defend a family in Texas against the RIAA for being sued. And we are a member of the RIAA. They were extremely upset. I got called to Washington, blah, 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 blah. And I just looked at them and went, do you think a teenager understands what intellectual property is? And I said, and you know, they're all folks, you know, my age. I just went, how many in this room have broken the you know, copyright law? They've all got their hands in their pockets. Okay, so, okay, let me phrase this a different way. How many of you have made mixed cassettes? to you know, share with friends. The hands went up. I went, you've all broken the law. The law that you're trying to litigate, you've broken. But why did you break the law? You wanted to share your passion of music with others. So that's what's happening here. What you don't realize is that you can't control it. And they're all like, well, of, of like, you know, of course we can. And, you know, I was like, well, music's a utility. It's water. If you put it in a bottle, it takes on value. And they're like, no, music's wine. It's wine. It's the best wine around. And we own it. And it's limited. I said, it's not limited. The minute that you release it, it's, it's free. I said, you need to learn how to value free. And I said, the problem is it starts with how you view music. You view it as intellectual property. The artist who wrote it views it as choruses, verses, bridges, lyrics. The fan that consumes it 
attaches their emotions to the emotion of the artist. They own that song. It's their emotions that they just attach to it. You can think back 10 years to it, 10, 20 years ago to a song that you loved. It's a bookmark in your life. It'll take you back to exactly what you were doing when that song was meaningful. And you're telling me that I own that emotion? No, you do. The business of music is the monetization of that emotion. That's the whole business. Not unlike yoga. Okay? Not unlike yoga. Okay? Yoga and music, exact same business. Thousands of years old. It's about the monetization of people's emotions. Creating a place or a safe place where they can let down their emotions and they can grow and they can feel good. The most powerful thing in the music business for me was getting letters from kids whose lives were saved because of the music that my artist created. I get those same letters in the yoga side. But how that, how my centers, my community has saved their lives. It's the same business. So knowing that, how do you go about changing a whole company that's based on selling units? Or that the major driver happens to be artist management, which is a cash business, zero value. It's only what you make and kill that year. Okay? My choice was stop being a manager. So at the height of my career, I made the emotional decision not to be a manager. Now, you just can't phone up all of your clients and tell them that you're no longer going to be a manager. It's, it's, a, it's just basically a fade-out process. But once I had made that, it freed me up to look at my company because I was no longer emotionally connected to the artists. I was looking at my business, not their business. And that was profound. The, the amount of freedom that I felt, the release of all that stress and tension created by others that I had to deal with, I was really good at deleting drama because we know that a lot of songs come from drama. I loved the songs, but I wouldn't like the you know, 2 a.m. phone calls. My phone has not been in my bedroom for over a decade. Yeah. I don't get calls past maybe 7 o'clock at night. I have a life. But I had to shape that life. So when I looked at my company, I went, management, probably 70% of the revenues. Millions and millions of dollars of commissions a year. Okay? Publishing, maybe 5%. The label, the other 25 per, per cent. So Rick and Mark and had done a really good job at, at, at building the label from the cash that management was throwing in it, which is exactly what they should have been doing. And they did a really, really good job of it. But that's great. That is the revenue. That's the cash flow. But when I looked at the value, management, pretty much zero. If I stopped managing that day, the only value that I would have would be any sunset clauses. Maybe a couple million dollars worth of you know, sunset clauses. Publishing, maybe only generated a half, maybe a half million dollars a year, was probably worth more than what the management company was. And same with the record label. So the value was not in management. The value was in creating something that had an ongoing life if I decided to go sit in an ashram, which a lot of lawyers thought that I'd gone and done. Um, funny enough, a lot of those lawyers who were golfing while I was doing yoga, they're now doing yoga. <laughs> Their bodies have gotten older and they've gotten smarter. So I looked at the company in a completely different way. I looked at it from a value proposition, not a cash proposition. I had stripped my emotion out. I was no longer working for my artists. I was working on my business that would support my artists. And the stronger my business, the better opportunities my artists would have. That's a, quite a dramatic shift. So I had two things to do. I had to figure out how to build that value rapidly based on what I saw as the future. And then I had to figure out a way to bring 60 people along for this ride. So it didn't take much of a conversation, probably about this long, to get the three other owners focused. 
because they had pretty much learned over 20 years if Terry wants to go in a certain direction, we're going in that direction. But it's always nice to have some, valid, some validation that they're going to step in and actually be you know, part of that team. Right? Then it was talking about the future to the rest of the company because the business was starting to go down. The fear in the room was crazy. After I'd written this paper, I you know, went and I did a huge thing at Midem. And I was in, I did about probably 25 talks around the world at various music conferences. Because what we were proposing was really quite radical. The last one I did was Canadian Music Week. And I stopped talking because Rick, one of my partners, phoned me up after the conference and says, you need to stop talking at conferences. <laughs> people are phoning me up and they're screaming at me. He didn't realize that I'd, during, after my keynote, people were screaming at me during the like, Q&A. They were screaming at me from fear. They were so fearful of what I was saying. They were pulling up the drawbridges. They were getting the arrows ready. They were sending out the litigators. It was just nasty. So when I, when I looked at the company, I went, okay, I'm not going to be an artist manager. Publishing with Inside the World that I envision is at most going to have 15% of the value. Masters are going to have 85% of the value. They don't now, but they're going to. So, but the problem is, is that my publishing business wasn't, wasn't big enough to do anything. So I went, okay, first thing we have to do is we have to build this and then we have to sell it. So, you know, I went $7 million in debt, bought a bunch of publishing stuff. It was all, you know, really craggly and dirty. We shaved it, cleaned it up, got it really well organized, got the metadata properly, and then sold it for about $22 million. Took those monies, told all my shareholders, I'm not paying out a dividend. No one's getting anything. Put it all into master's. Now I would say the value of network is about $125 million of value. And it's only going to continue to go up. A lot of what we wrote in that paper is now reality. A lot of what we saw is now reality. The data that we started tracking then, which I'll show you some of it tomorrow, we're off by maybe 3% over eight years. We know where the business is going, and thus we know where we're going. Our job is to beat what the business is doing. Our you know, job is to make our own projections conservative. But there's an understanding of value. And it's something that, you know, a value of $1 with inside management is $1. If you get fired, there's nothing left for you. Probably 90% of the managers will get fired. That's pretty brutal. Not only will it financially cause you issues, it'll mostly crush you. Because chances are you've put in as much emotional energy to that artist as what the artists themselves have. They keep going and you're left with nothing. As a record label, I'm left with the intellectual property. I don't care. I can still work it, I can still add value to it, and I can still monetize it. So management's worth nothing, zero. And that's probably pretty hard for most people in this room to hear, okay? You have no retirement savings plan. The managers with Inside Network had no retirement savings plan. The only people that owned the existing intellectual property 10, 12 years ago were the, were the four owners. So to bring my staff along to a new vision I also had to make them part of my company. I had to show them the hard reality of where they sat, but show them the plan to get them to a stability that if they ever did get fired or they ever wanted to stop doing management, they will have built up a nest of value that could support them for the rest of their lives. So probably 75% of my staff with Inside Network have shares with Inside Network. 
So when we drive that value up by 20, 30% a year, they know it's going up by 20, 30% a year. Now we're not doing this to sell network. I have no plans to sell network. I'm having way too much fun. <laughs> what we are gonna do is turn it into a dividend fund. So we're gonna reach a point in about five years where we're making so much money that I can't spend it. I can't effectively spend it properly. And at that point, we roll it off into a dividend fund. It's no different than a real estate REIT or any sort of you know, capital sort of exit you know, cushion. And what that's going to do is it's going to set up a secondary vehicle that's a public vehicle that the company will own about 60% of, which means the shareholders of the company will own 60% of this. It will pay a dividend back to all of those shareholders. But because it's public, they can also sell parts of it if that's what they want to do. So it's a liquidity event without affecting the ongoing business, the ongoing concern, I'll call it. So network, as it creates new catalog, every year will flow it into this dividend fund. So every year there will be a look, some form of liquidity event that people can see more beyond what their um, salaries are. They can get that passionate income back. That's the ultimate strategy.